So one thing I wanted to ask was uh, about We Are Change. Did you start your Orlando branch of We Are Change back in the day, or are you just a member of that particular branch? I basically, when I uh, was seeking out a, like a We Are Change chapter, when I found the Orlando one, it was kind of just like a guy that was like, yeah, man, I've been doing this for years, but I'm not really doing it anymore. Do you want to take over? Mm. And I was like, sure. So, and the exact same thing happened with March Against Monsanto. I remember people just kind of, it just fizzled out after a year. And I was like, well, I'm newly awakened to all this and was eager to get involved. So I just kind of took over what they had started. Um, and since then, it's just been kind of a one-man show. I just, you know, when you get going with doing things, you kind of need like an umbrella kind of to work under or like an organization to have when you're sending emails to people and I was just really inspired by like what I saw Luke doing with confronting those people like Henry Kissinger and, and all that. That's what really kind of lit a fire under me in the beginning in 2012, seeing those videos. And I was like, well, is there a chapter around here? And I found it, found the guy and he was like, yeah, do you want it? And I was like, sure. And then the rest is history. Um, and as you know, it doesn't take much. Really, all you need is kind of a, a drive and a passion for what you're doing and a, a camera. And then you can go out and you can either, you know, interview people, confront people. I and mean, I just kind of got my my feet in anything I could at that point. I was just like the rabbit hole was overwhelming. It was like there's so many issues. I didn't know what to focus on and find my like groove yet. So it was like GMOs and the Federal Reserve and fluoride and the vaccines. And I'm just like... It was nuts, but um, I eventually started, I think I found like my priorities and what was most important to me, what was affecting us like most about our health, the biggest deceptions, and then that's where I kind of shifted my focus to. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, We Are Change started as a 9-11 truth thing, but it morphed into like an alternative media, expose any government corruption that there is, you know? Mm. It was originally Luke Radowski, was it? The uh, found one of the loose change guys, I think. Yep. Did did Alex Jones have any say in We Are Changes founding? I know he promoted it and he was on so. board with Luke in the beginning. Yeah, I think they were just loosely connected through the like 9-11 truth movement. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously, Luke was on the show, I think, a handful of times in the beginning. And I'm sure they've still connected over the years, but I don't think he had anything to do with We Are Change. He just kind of mm. featured Luke sometimes on Infowars for some of the confrontations and 9-11 stuff. Um, and I mean, and just to get really specific, I don't know if Luke was the original, original founder, but he's had it since almost the inception and pretty much just like calls himself that without going, well, there was this one guy in the very, very beginning, but it was only for a short time. And I actually think he passed away. I can't remember his name. But I think he was involved with, like, the towers. Like, his father had passed in them or something like that. I think I, re I can picture his face. I think I remember that. Um, yeah. But yeah I, don't, I don't remember his name either. Okay. So And um, I think I've heard you say that We Are Change is pretty, like, what would you call it, decentralized, and that you, you basically are able to do your own thing to the point that even if somebody thought, oh, we are changed, that's a, a some official conspiracy organization and whatever, it's more just like you said, uh, it's a, a title, it's something to send your emails out with, it's something that people would, you know, recognize as a legitimate group rather than just Justin in Florida. Um, so That's right, right? So it's, it's not, you don't get any sort of dictates from above is there a mission statement is there something you have to uphold to be a we are change group how does that work i mean the, i guess there is a mission statement but i wouldn't say that we've ever had to like adhere to it like when i started i didn't call up luke and say hey can i take over mm -hmm. orlando or how do i do this it was just it's very loose you just did it i went out of my way to put like you know our facebook and our links on the main website and try to email the people for it but there was I didn't really connect with Luke until the day came that we worked on something together. You know, he's not controlling or even paying attention to any of the chapters unless you're doing something to get on his radar. Uh, so, yes, super decentralized. I actually get messages sometimes about Flat Earth and people will be like, oh, well, what does we are changed think of this? And they get all upset. And I'm like, well, 
you know, Luke doesn't, there is no organization and hierarchy and rules and thing. it's decentralized. So like, you know, yeah, some of the flatter stuff I do goes under that umbrella, but for the most part, like, we're truth seekers and we're exposing all the truths. Like there's nothing out of the ordinary about this. It's just, as you know, people are upset and looking for a way to, I don't know, shut down the topic and be like, oh, well, your boss can't let you do this. Well, there is no boss with a decentralized you know, community and network. So it works really well that way. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? I lost my train of thought. It was something about uh, what you had just asked, I think, with the chapters or decentralization. It'll come back to um, me, maybe. Maybe the mission statement? Did you know if, oh, is there? That was it, yeah. So we do have one, um, and I put it, you know, on my pages. And, I mean, I align with it, and I totally agree with it. Uh, it's something that I think I probably gravitated to We Are Change Orlando and We Are Change in general just because it was something I align with the most. I'm like, well, we really need to flip the media back because I was like, why are we lied to about all these topics? Well, if the media wasn't controlled, I would be more informed about what was in my food and my medicine and where I live, but they control all of that. So I'm like, well, let's be our own media. And it's like, holy cow, people are doing that. And I found organizations like, you know, the anti-media and We Are Change, and I was like, okay, good got on board with that the mission statement's great i haven't really you know found a reason to to venture out of that and you know another good reason to use it was i need to sneak into an event and confront this politician i can't just be justin i need to be like i'm from wrc orlando da, 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 and have like a website so like i've had to sneak into events and drop the website and i've had people actually like a courtroom person look up the website and be scrolling it and like okay well all right, I guess this is official. It's showing Luke's articles about like, you know, the war in Ukraine and like Bilderberg and he's reading it and he's like, okay, I guess this is, a, you know, so I, I used it to my advantage and that's, those are the main reasons, you know, that I got on board and have stuck with it. Mm. I like that you felt the drive to become the media. That's pretty much my own as well with books and videos and everything with the internet age and this thing we call social media, the, the best thing we can do with it is become the media and be the independent media. It's, you know, never before in history has there been an opportunity for every Tom, Dick, and Harry that has the intelligence and the drive can actually report, you know, every day on video, audio, you name it, we can get our messages, ideas, and facts out there in a way that generations before us could have only dreamed possible. But what do we do? Twerking videos and, you know, selfies and whatever the 90, 90 plus percent of people use social media and the internet for, uh, it's just totally not worth it. But, you know, if we get back to, you know, using these technologies for what they actually could be, um, you know, we could, we could end this whole just all, all of these deceptions and this government overreach and control, this could be ended easily, as well as the dinosaur media. Uh, if people really took the reins and the responsibility, we would become and are becoming the media and making these others obsolete, which is what's happening to the mainstream media now. Yeah, and it's so true, and when and it's really happening, like in real time, I think we're witnessing, we're watching certain mainstream media, their numbers are, are failing, like CNN started some new thing, it failed immediately, I've heard Vice, BuzzFeed, a lot of organizations are closing their doors, and then you have people like Anomaly, who's like a, a, a Instagram, you know, truther uh, personality, who has crazy viewership. And he's just a guy who started talking about the news and the truth. And it's just crazy the pull we have. You know, we get some people that really have a platform and start talking about these things. They just are moving mountains with, like, levels of awareness. So I'm, it's good to see. I'm, I'm happy. And obviously you're no stranger to that world. I see you, you've always covered, you know, whatever platform is out there, you at least dish out all your material to each one and try to make sure it's in each place because it's like you never know which one is going to have that ripple effect and go viral from that point on so 
exactly. Yeah, I tried to both have depth and breadth in my activism. Um, so trying to be regular, you know, uploading regular new things, but then also putting out, you know, I'll be about a collection of material that's just sitting maybe on one platform or two platforms, and then there's all these other new platforms that keep popping up, and yeah, you, so I'll start uploading to all of them as well, and so you get your database in all of these other platforms, and people that might have never found you on YouTube will find you on Rumble or whatever because they've just started watching that as their exclusive video sharing platform now, or, right. or Rockfin or some of these others. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worth um, keeping a catalog of all your, your old work, your old media, and then finding new places to upload it because you're definitely going to get new eyes on the material. Um, yeah. Yeah, par a big part of, of activism is advertising, you know, marketing basically, is finding ways to get eyes on what you've done. Otherwise, it's, it's like it didn't happen, especially in, in this day and age where attention is one of the um, most valuable currencies that you can, can have now because it's, there's so many distractions and places that people can place their attention to try and convince someone that this, this is worth five minutes. Please watch this. <laughs> it's getting I, right. more, and more and more difficult. And you have to be more and more sensationalized and mo use more and more advertising or marketing techniques, good thumbnails and catchy phrase titles and stuff like that. Otherwise, people are just going to go right over your video that they very well might have really wanted to see. But but they, you know, right. there's so many other things there um, you had, trying to get their you had attention. Like that, Second and a half to get their attention before you were scrolled by. Like, yeah. It could have just been the thumb, and that's it, and you're done. And like, that really is the world we live in today. And I think that's why it's so important to have, I think, like you said it, like almost like marketing skills with this. We can't just be, oh, 9 11 was an inside job, and like screaming it from the, the crazy guy on the corner. The last thing we want to look like is the crazy guy on the corner. That's why I re respected so much of your work. You know, that was one of the reasons you probably hooked me with this topic. You know, a lot of people don't know. I had a girl, you know, that I respected her judgment. And I had been writing off, you know, Flat Earth for some time. But she kept posting about it. And it was it was like, it was like a little thorn in my side. I'm like, ugh, I like her. And I like her judgment or opinion. This is, this is not right. This is, this is bad. This is wrong. She's wrong with this one. And then finally I watched it. And it was 200 Proofs. And I remember thinking like, you know, it was very much your, like your presentation, not so much also like coupled with the factual information. And I've always used that to my like advantage of getting information out. It's like, we've got to sound, we've really got to like represent this well because we're already called crazy before we get in the room. So like if you walk in and then you're like, oh wow, Huh, well, the guy is actually dressed nice and he's got some good information and it was a really creative campaign too. It's, it is marketing and that's why creativity is so important. I give Joshua Coleman credit in almost every interview I do because he created those red and black vaccine signs that you've probably seen me with. Mm -hmm. The banners, the airplane messages, the, the billboard trucks. We did so many things with this creative campaign to educate people about vaccines and it, we would have never got the attention if we if it wasn't so specific and targeted and um, creative. And I have to give him that credit. Like I just don't have that. Like in my, I don't have that bone. I can't draw very well. I don't know how to create like a targeted campaign for these specific people. But he did. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm replicating this in Florida. Mm -hmm. And then I've even taken some of those skills and techniques and put it in other topics, like you know flat earth or genetically modified mosquitoes and different things to it's all about getting like you said getting in front of people catching that attention and and and, and having good presentation you know you just don't want to be like scream the the blunt message and then be out because that's not going to resonate with people they're not going to want to ask more questions right um but it is it is the tide is turning I see it with what just the other day. I see Rockfin is promoting like Eddie Bravo and clips from the new level are, are in the Rockfin sponsored posts on Facebook. Mm. So, like, I'm getting Facebook ads with Eddie Bravo in it. 
And I'm like, this is actually really a, a good thing to see. I don't know how Rockfin's getting away with that. They must, whoever runs that place must be awake or something, but. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Yeah, they seem to be on, I mean, I, I really like what I've seen, I guess, with Rumble, Rockfin. I, I don't use Rockfin, but like, they seem to be hosting like our material and, and mm. being able to promote it on um, other social media sites is good too because you see it it's getting to people that do not they're like what is this crap you know in the comments it's filtering in because they're sponsoring it so that's kind of nice so it's reaching, they can't, it's like, it's I, reaching I the people we want want to reach yeah. That's the other thing. Uh, yeah it doesn't always feel good to get to the you know the newbies but those are the ears that you most want to prick prick up you want and it, it's never going to be a uh, warm reception people hearing these things for the first time so you got to expect the the blowback you can't really expect people to see something the very first time and be completely awakened and appreciative and um, write comments thanking you it's more likely that they're going to want to debate you and uh, you know knee-jerk reaction but uh, you've planted the seed and that's that's the thing that we have to do and so, so again rather than I was saying about depth and breadth. Don't go too deep, say, with a guy like this that has just started and you can see he's flailing and knee-jerk reacting. You might want to quickly answer every question he has, every objection he makes. You want to, no, no, no. But it's actually way more effective for you to just plant that seed, let him bug out for a while with his own cognitive dissonance. You just go work somewhere else find some more fertile ground to plant some more seeds in the meantime. And then when that guy calms down and actually does a bit more research and looks into it and finds out that there's maybe not as much evidence on the thing that he thought he thought, and there's way more evidence on the thing that you presented, he's going to calm down. He might come back to you. He'll have actually a legitimate question that you can ask and you can have a, a real conversation at that point rather than if you forced it at the beginning when it really wasn't the time. So that's one thing that I think anyone doing any type of activism really needs to take to heart is that it's a long battle. Every every sentence you say in one of these subjects plants a seed and you can you can plant that seed and walk away every time with a smile, not even, you know, having to worry about their reaction because you are having this subconscious effect and over time uh, it, it it takes hold and human psychology people need that time for them to feel like they have come to the conclusion themselves and you didn't just force them to come to this thing. You just kind of presented it, you gave them the time, then they got to think about it themselves, maybe do some Googling, watch a couple of videos, and now they might come, this happens to me all the time, they might come back to you with the exact phrase, perhaps the exact seed that you tried to plant then, and as if they didn't hear it, as if you didn't, you weren't the one that told them this thing, they come back and tell you, hey, did you know that eight point, you know, 7.98 inches per mile squared is how much the curvature of the earth would have to be? That's ridiculous, that's way too much. We would see that. And, you know, I, I told you that exactly <laughs> a month ago. <laughs> I, I've actually gotten to that point with people before. I've, I've told them, I've like, did you forget that I told you that exact fact like two months ago? And they'll be like, no, you didn't. Or sometimes like, that's right. You did tell me that. But either way, they forgot. Right. In the time in between, they forgot that I actually gave them the, the exact piece of information that now, wow, it's such a revelation. Literally goes back to the uh, a motto I've had since the beginning of my activism is never underestimate the power of planting a seed. And that's it right there. And you can just let it blossom. Go about your day. I, and that part you said about not being pushy, I learned was so effective. I had a job one time where I was still working in like a restaurant atmosphere. Needed to get out of there. But like I just came in there, did what I needed to do, made good money and would get out. But I would always bring my own food because they just had garbage food in there. I'm vegan, so I'm like bringing the salad every day. And everybody would always be like, yeah, what do you got? What do you got in here? What do you got today, vegan? And like always questioning and like curious. But I would never try to tell them what to eat, try to push it on them. 
nothing. I didn't even talk about my food, but they were always asking. And then they would come over and I'm like, oh, you got questions? What are your questions? And then I'd talk to them about it. And then the same thing, I had a guy who I worked with who said, you know what? But one of the reasons I got thinking about Flat Earth more than anything was the fact that you were never really trying to push it on me. Mm. Like, I found out that you were, you were, you know, you thought of, you were, uh, had that belief or whatever. And I'm like, okay, but he's not really, it's weird. He's not trying to push it on me. So he started asking more questions. And I've learned sometimes if people just kind of see what you're doing, they will genuinely get curious. And like you said, when they're ready, they'll either go find it themselves, they'll come back and ask those questions. It's just, I've learned it a million times, the person demanding that you answer their list of questions in a comment section is not the person that's ready to open, be open and learn. They're not, mm -hmm. they're the one that wants to argue and prove you wrong, say that you're an idiot. The people that are really curious message you and will say, hey, I saw your comment. Do you have any more videos? Da, 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 da. And then I'm like, yeah, here's Eric DeBay's Eclipse video. <laughs> Boom. And I send it. I literally have like sections of some of your work and other people's work in sections now and frequently ask like question diagrams. So when people mm. give me this bank of questions we always get, I'm like, OK, circumnavigation. I go get. I type out my response and then I give them the two to three videos. I'm like, here's an experiment. Here's a great explanation with visuals. And then you just deliver it to them. And I've, I've noticed people are like, oh, wow, this is not, this isn't pushy. Here's a diagram and a visual and I'm on my way. And it's just, I've, I've just, it's become so effective and I encourage people to do that. It's so much better than trying to stop trying to convince people or win an argument. Mm. You're not, you're just trying to show them like a door or show them a path and hope that they eventually go down it themselves. That's mm -hmm. really the best advice I give people because it is, it's like a, a struggle waking up every day. It's like, I use the other analogy with pinky in the brain. It's like, what are we going to do today? Mm -hmm. Try to wake up the people. You know? <laughs> how do, how do you get to that relative that you've been, you know, beating on the door for 10 years or how do you get to that friend or that coworker? Well, you probably, have planted all the seeds you need to with them. Let mm -hmm. them be go about your life. And then they're going to be like, you know what? He's still eating that diet and he looks great. Or he's still not watching the TV and he seems happy. I'm going to come back and ask about, you know, those things. They just shut the world down for three years. Now I'm kind of <laughs> curious, you know, and that's when those things start happening. And, um, you know, just to end on that thought, mm. the COVID pandemic was like one of the best things that ever happened to some regular people that would have never woke up. You know, it was like mm -hmm. another 9 /11. And I've had a lot of people come to me and say, I would have never found Same. your page or found any of this information if it wasn't for them shutting the world down. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very uh, experience the same thing. They push too hard and uh, a few more eyes <laughs> open up, which is the, the good thing. The, uh, the old, uh, the more you... <clears throat> tighten your grip the more grains of sand flow out of your fingers that's hopefully what's going to continue to happen as the government overreach and this whole new world order program of centralization of all, all things in the world continues <clears throat> people are going to understand that this is a problem and that needs solving and that we need to find decentralized ways um, around the, the this New world, one world order system that's growing. <clears throat> um, and I agree with your whole thing about we just need to be about it. We don't need to be loud about it and speak up about it. When when you are when activism and this, you know, this becomes your life, say, to the degree that it does with it has with me, when people ask me, you know, like my parents would ask, like, what did you do this week? Well, literally, maybe the only thing I did all week was study 9-11 back in, back in the day when they didn't particularly want to talk about this kind of stuff. And we'd kind of come to a, a truce about like, well, let's not talk about that stuff so much. And it's like, all right. And then uh, it's like, so what did you do this week? And it's like, well, honestly, I read, I read this book. I watched this documentary. And other than that, I mean, I ate, slept. Uh, the only thing that would be worthy of talking about was the new knowledge that I've acquired 
and then at that point, it's just like, so are we going to talk about it, or is our our Skype chat <laughs> over? Because <laughs> it's like, you want to know what I'm what I did this week or not? And that's actually became quite an effective method, both for them and for for other people to to wake them up, especially family members, because they're it's really difficult to breach these subject with family members, though it's often the people you most want to wake up. My advice would be this is don't try too hard to wake up family members because one, they're going to be the absolute hardest people to wake up basically because they know you and because they know you, it's you're no longer an authority. It's easy to debate with you. They don't want to just concede that you opened their eyes to some magnificent truth. It's again, it's human psychology. And so knowing that it's better to just be about it to the degree that they come to you being like, hey, I, I saw you on YouTube the other day, or I saw you on the news. What, what were you what were you doing at the city hall meeting in a suit talking about the ISS uh, or whatever? And, and the more you just be about it, it ends up being way more effective than trying to talk about it and, and, and trying to convince, like you said, don't convince or don't try to convince just plant the seed just say the thing or even better than statements are questions just ask a question think of a good socratic question that leads the listener towards the conclusion that you want and by asking it in question form rather than making a, a statement you haven't you know you haven't done anything wrong if they disagree or if they agree since it's in question form you're now giving the onus on them to actually think and you're it's helping um force them basically to think rather than just allowing them to let whatever you're saying go in one ear and out the other and by doing that you can start a, a dialogue so again be about it rather than talk about it and if you're going to talk about it ask questions rather than making statements and trying to get people to agree with your statements. Would you agree? Would you agree with that, Justin? Yeah. Question mark? <laughs> I would. And you know who comes to mind is Dell from uh, Beyond the Imaginary Curve, I believe. Mm -hmm. his, uh, he really inspired me with his man on the street stuff and asking people those questions. It was just, there's something about walking someone into something blind and making them think about it without having that preconceived, you know, bias and judgment on a topic. And that's really how I have, that's how I went, walked into Scott Kelly. That's how I walk into the pilot situations. Well, I was actually just flew recently and I was in Atlanta with some time to kill. I don't know if you've ever been to the Atlanta airport, but it's a madhouse. There's people everywhere. There's literally a pilot was walking by me like every 30 seconds. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's pilots everywhere. I need to, I need to start talking to them. So I start asking them, you know, one of them, one of my last flights said, um, you know, as soon as I asked him about accounting for any curvature, he's like, I've been flying for almost 30 years. I've never really thought about that. Mm. <laughs> and that's and I'm like, exactly. That is exactly <laughs> my point. And the other guys, you know, typically will give you like a knee jerk response of, oh, yeah, well, you know, the, the planes, obviously, you know, we've got this thing called the da -da -da -da, and they go down this road of really nothing and i'm like okay so the plane's doing it i'm like when well, your partner just said gravity was doing it so which one is it and then and then they really get thinking but this whole time you don't want to ever mention where, what you're going what, what you're getting at or that you're a flat earther or any of that mm -hmm. and it really is it's a way to get their wheels turning as i told those pilots that day i said don't think about it too hard with what i just said just get the wheels turning like you're not account you're flying you're operating this aircraft as if the ground is not moving and if it's not curving there's nothing about this flight that will tell you otherwise and if they really just try to stick to that they'll go okay well you do you do have a point like yeah it doesn't seem that we do mm -hmm. okay <laughs> and when people exactly when people like yourself or Dell approach like you're approaching people in public that have other stuff to do rather than screaming at them through a bullhorn like Alex Jones or something might do, uh, it politely goes up to them and asks them if they could have a conversation and be filmed, and then starts with questions that maybe aren't even directly about Flat Earth, but are just about the, your thought process and science in general. And then eventually you lead them into 
the flat earth subject and then they're much more willing to go there with you because you've presented yourself well you've you've basically you've had some foundation for the conversation and then when you get to the the actual subject at hand uh, because you're asking them questions the whole time rather than making statements you're never overstepping your bounds in their eyes because even though the questions you're asking to them are like outlandish like oh my gosh i didn't realize i was about to be asked flat earth questions but okay you're you're catching their genuine reaction which is fun to see in the moment of someone that just realizes like i am talking to a flat earther aren't i okay <laughs> okay let's okay and then they, they're, they're trying to remember all their globe earth info right from a third grade to try and, uh, you know, so what is your, your, what would be the one proof that you would have that, you know, earth's a spinning ball? And you, again, keep putting the onus on them rather than yourself. You know, it's not necessary. If you already know the earth is flat and you're talking to people about it, guess what? You can be confident in silence and just asking them questions and letting them slowly come to the same conclusion you have through your leading questions rather than trying to be pushy with statements and facts and figures and whatever ask them to, you know do they know the facts and figures do you do you know the circumference of your ball earth do you know the four motions that the ball earth and the sun and the galaxy and and the expanding universe are supposedly going under do you know those speeds they usually don't and then once you can tell them and show to them that you know their model better than they do, and then as they start thinking about some of these aspects of their model, they're like, yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? And suddenly you have just become way more effective an activist than someone who thought they were reaching hundreds with their bullhorn because, yeah, maybe your annoying voice is reaching hundreds of people, but did you wake up a single one of them? Or did you instead turn off a hundred people even more to the flat earth message because they they don't like your style and they hear oh, some of those flat earth guys now they're now they're yelling in the parks Ugh, i knew i didn't like this flat earth thing versus right. someone like dell approaching you politely in the park and asking these questions and he will have opened one person's eyes rather than further closed a hundred people's eyes by yelling at them and so you can definitely take you know take that bit of activism advice and put it to work yeah the megaphone thing is so delicate i've used it over the years and i've been like actually quite and i'm have no problem saying it quite controlling with it because i know the first person the wrong person that gets it in their hands and the media gets that clip or the like you said someone's just like oh my gosh did you hear what they were just saying in front of those children and they're crazy that it's just you ruin the image in a split second and like I've done it I've used it before where I will literally talk to a crowd of people going into like the Super Bowl or something and I like you said I'll just ask questions did you know that you know four billion dollars has been paid out to vaccine injured families and like a couple of the nurses are like is that true like you know and they start thinking and then when it's done it's like thank you enjoy the game like you literally are still have to be nice to these people and be or they're not going to be receptive you know, I've even had videos where I've confronted some of these scumbags in our world, and I say I've uh, approached them with sir. And I'll have people in the comments, I can't believe you called them sir. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to get them to a answer my question. If I called them, you know, dickbag or something, <laughs> they're not going to turn around and go, what would you like, you know, me to answer? Mm. So it's, it's all a strategy. Um, and you're right, like t most people, 90 plus percent of the time, the megaphone is probably hurting you. Like, you've got to use it in a very specific way and not the whole time. If you're just constantly shouting, you're, you're really doing more harm than yeah. you are good. Agreed. Yeah, I th I'm thinking of that. Did you ever see that Austin gun rally that Alex Jones invaded? <laughs> there was like was this. It old, like an old school one? Very old school, way back in the day. And it, it was a, so. a pretty, pretty peaceful little rally, and they had microphones set up. Um, but you know they had speakers and they had a scheduled scheduled list of guests and everything and people were were listening and and everything was fine until Alex and the crew shows up and he's just got this megaphone and he's yelling over the people the scheduled speakers who have their microphones set up and he's just like not allowed to listen inside job and all this stuff where 
I don't know if everybody was saying gun rhetoric at the time because it was a it was an anti gun thing. But and then the the organizers are coming up to him and they're like, Alex, we 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 invited you to speak on the microphone. We can have you up there. It's like, and, and he's like, Shh. he's getting them off of his shoulder and just keeps on going on his megaphone. It was quite a an exposure of, of Alex at the time, but it, it also it was a good um, example of what we're saying, how there was a polite demonstration, an anti, uh, not an anti, a pro-gun demonstration being set up. And, uh, you know, they were, and you got to be real um, careful if that's the thing that you're promoting is the Second Amendment, you know, like g g independent gun ownership. The last right. thing you want to be doing is seeming like a crazy person screaming and stuff, which is exactly what, what Alex Jones made it look like uh, when he showed up. But before then, it, it was a, you know, a peaceful, polite protest that was potentially changing people's minds um, for the better, whereas the second he showed up, I would say it went and devolved into chaos and anyone that was there w would have, you know, n not thought that, you know, okay, I'm going to go go defend my Second Amendment right now that I heard this nutbag with, <laughs> with a, a bullhorn. Yeah, there's definitely some people that are not our best spokesperson, <laughs> spokespeople, yeah. and that's like, that's that's another reason I take all interviews because I'm like, well... I don't take this interview from this person who I know is going to write a hit piece and make us look crazy, they're going to find someone who's really going to fly off the mouth and make us look really bad. So I'm like, I better do it and do my best to keep us at least somewhat sane. How did you first start when you, um, like when you, you said you got We Are Change Orlando from another guy and now it's yours? What, did, what was your first plan of action did you start up was there already a youtube channel did you start that up did you start doing street activism or and, and what subjects uh, did you start with i think there was already a youtube channel not much on it but i think at that point i started the march against monsanto so i was hosting that uh, yearly um but then it was just very random things like interviewing people about police brutality or covering the closed Walmarts. There was that strange Walmart closures in 2015. Mm, yeah. um, I'm trying to think of my early videos. Like interviewing um, scientists that toxic pesticides were leaching into our local lakes and turning the alligators into hermaphrodites because of mm -hmm. the pesticide overload. Interviewing people like that. Um, I guess it was a lot of environmental stuff with Monsanto, pesticides, the bees. But then at the same time, I was like going to Washington, D.C. with the anonymous march or Atlanta to a Federal Reserve protest. It was really just a little bit of everything with We Are Change. Uh, but the Monsanto thing was my main thing, for sure. Mm. And so that had its it had, I think I like a lot of movements. They have their like their initial like wave. It hits this peak, and then it dies back down. And I think we hit that with the Monsanto thing. And I felt like, I don't know, with some certain movements, like we kind of checked the box. Mm -hmm. People know what GMOs are. Mm -hmm. Everything's labeled organic or non-GMO. You can either eat crap or you can make your own or grow your own. It's almost like what else was there to say? Monsanto changed their name and got bought by Bayer. Uh, they were being sued in court, billions of dollars for Roundup. So, like, in my mind... We raised a lot a of public awareness, yeah. and karma kind of bit them with the lawsuit. So I was like, let's move on. So I moved yeah. on to like vaccines, 5G, flat earth. Those ended up being my next main like focuses. Cool. Now, and you also said that you're a, a vegan. So I was wondering, did that play into your Monsanto activism? Have you been vegan since 2012, since you started? Or how has your Probably. health health and diet journey gone in your life yeah i was um probably ate the standard american diet up until i woke up and mm. then when i found out about the monsanto thing i really did clean up my diet but eventually it was like okay probably shouldn't be eating as much of the meat and the dairy and for health reasons i was like cutting it back and by i'd say 2014 or 15 i was vegetarian and then the more i learned about dairy i was like uh, and then I met my girlfriend in 2016, and she was the one who kind of just kind of pushed me over the edge. 
and was like, yeah, told me some more facts about cheese I didn't know. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, wow. And I just kind of kicked that to the curb. And then so I've been vegan since 2016, probably mm-hmm. well, let's say 2017 because it was the very end. Um, but yeah, it was it evolved from learning about Monsanto and then the animal agriculture industry. I probably did it for health reasons first, but then I learned the ethical animal aspect of it too. Um, so yeah, that was part of it as well, which is funny because nowadays all the vegans tend to hate me because they, uh, you know, I don't, there's always exceptions to the rule, but most of them ended up wearing lots of masks, taking lots of vaccines and voting for Joe Biden and marching for climate change. And I just was like, what happened? You know, some, a lot of you all were marching against Monsanto and it was like Monsanto and Bill Gates is bad. Six years later, fast forward, Pfizer and Bill Gates, good. Like, <laughs> what? I, and I think it was the Democrat, like, political, like, uh, sort of, my team is doing this, rah, rah, I have to just believe science. Mm-hmm. But, like, you don't trust the GMO science, and if you're vegan, you don't trust the dairy science. So where's the disconnect, you know? It's very hard for me to wrap my head around that one. Mm-hmm. Right. Though, yeah, I noticed uh, plenty of... Um, vegans and, and other groupings uh, falling for the pandemic. The one grouping that almost nobody, I think, fell for the pandemic is flat earthers. Did, do you know of any flat earthers that were duped by the pandemic? I, I know of maybe one, two I can think of, and I know a lot of flat earthers. Uh, yeah. I know quite a few, and I can't say any that got vaccinated or right. you know, if I saw them in a mask, they were doing it for their paycheck or something like, or to get on an airplane. You know, it 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 really was. You know, I remember thinking that going to one of the flat Earth conventions. I remember leaving and going because I've had a unique experience, like getting involved in so many topics. I'd go to the police brutality march, and I'm like, wait a minute, these people still vote Democrat and like aren't awake to these other topics. And I go to the environmental protest and I'm like, wait a minute. These people like shop organic, but they still believe in vaccines and climate change and X, Y, Z. And each movement, it was these levels of awakening. But when you get to the flat earth community, I went to the flat earth convention and nobody believes that an airplane hit the Pentagon. Nobody fell for the pandemic. Nobody is getting vaccinated. And it was just across the board. And I think it's because like you've said, you don't find out about the mother of all conspiracies and then just say, oh, but they're telling the truth about the pesticide or they're telling the truth about the the money. You know, you kind of, I think at that point, you do throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm kind of glad I found out about the rabbit hole in that way. I didn't find politics first. I found like the deeper parts, like the occult and the um, Federal Reserve and the, 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 the history of it. And at that point, it's like, well, if it's this old, politics has to be, for the most part, a complete sham. Mm -hmm. So I was never a believer in it. It wasn't until recently I started paying attention locally more. But that's just because I've gotten more of a voice locally. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm glad I came in that way because I didn't fall for, oh, my gosh, so much of that other stuff. You know, a lot of people came into this in 2016 and unfortunately find things like QAnon or Donald Trump. And um, while they, a lot of those people did find their way out the, of the forest, some of those people are still like, you know, just just on those mainstream political talking, you know, circles. And it's it's unfortunate to see, but exactly, yeah. And that's what was my point is how some of these issues, some of these conspiracy topics or political issues, they might open you up to one sector of deception in the world. But the flat earth subject I've found is just so foundational and fundamental and within its umbrella, it encapsulates so many other important truths and and conspiracies that once you get to the flat earth reality level of understanding the conspiratorial nature, it's like your eyes are so open that all the new things that they throw at you, you're ready for it. You're so skeptical now. You're you're no longer a believer in mainstream media or the mainstream political system or even the mainstream ideas that come out. You found that 
you know, something so fringe and seemingly crazy as the flat earth ends up being the truth. Now it's like you have a new way of approaching new material now, rather than just being like, oh, is that the consensus truth? And okay, go, going along to get along as most people do. Once you, once you get to this level and you realize this, you never do that again. Any new information that comes in now has this new advanced flat earth type filter that it has to go through before you can, you know, give something a, a truth verdict. And so I think that really helps people. It gives them this new uh, way of filtering information. Basically, it gives them the, uh, rather than putting it on experts or their, their teachers or, the, you know, people at NASA or something, they are back in the driver's seat in the subject and they're like, okay, I'm the ultimate arbiter of truth here, actually. It's not this expert or that, this or that. It's me and what I decide from, from my investigations and looking into, you know, the, all the facts and figures and, and whatnot. And once you do that, you become the arbiter and you'll never give that up again like you did beforehand to the guy on TV, on the news anchor or the pundit or whoever else you were just believing their say so beforehand, you become the investigator. Um, so I think that's what people should should do is become their own detective. Like when you're looking at new media, new information, um, even all the way to say religious stuff, um, you know, when you read the Bible or, or other people's um, religious scriptures, to do it as if you're a detective and you're trying to get to the bottom. What is the truth of this? There's so many different religions here. Is one of them true? Are all of them true? Are none of them true? And same with, uh, you know, political things, conspiracies. You have to look at all sides of every issue. You know, there's usually two, maybe three or more sides of an issue. And if you've only looked at one and then made a decision, you know, there's no way that you, you've made a, a full truth analysis. And so that's basically what people, I think, do with Flat Earth. It takes a long time. You have to look at all these different avenues. And once you come to the Flat Earth conclusion, you give yourself now the power to do that with everything else. And you, and you realize you need to do that if you're going to come to these ultimate truths. You would have never come to that truth if you didn't take the time to actually research it for yourself and step out from the crowd who says, Flat Earth is absolutely crazy. You don't even need to look into that. That's dumb. You did look into it and you found out, whoa, it's real. So now you realize like, wow, I'm, I'm the trustworthy one here. Not everyone else I've ever listened to. And, and so it, I think, and that's what we need because so many people are giving their power away to all of these organizations and pundits and news anchors or what have you, rather than understanding that it's actually our responsibility to be our own experts in all fields I was just talking to someone. I don't. I don't think the term expert necessarily means what people think it means. Like most people think, an expert in a field means that what they say is probably correct, and you can just go along with it because they they are you know that's their thing. But basically, that's what an expert is. It's someone who um, delves into one particular subject super deep. And so they super specialize themselves. So basically an expert is just a super specialized human who has gone into one small area of human thought and been there for a long time. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that A, everything this guy says about that thing is true, or that B, they know everything there is to know about it and they're the ultimate arbiter. Oftentimes, what you find is people who become super specialized into a group like that, they lose the forest for the trees, or they lose the trees for the, well, I'm not sure how, which way it would go, but they lose something because they're so, they're so ne they're in it so far that somebody who's on the outside and can actually have a fresh pair of eyes and look at the subject and maybe actually consider something that, that this expert already knows is ridiculous, so he doesn't even look into it. But you, the newbie neophyte, who you don't know what's ridiculous and what isn't ridiculous, everything's on an even keel for you, so you research everything equally, 
And then you find that, huh, for me, the thing that the expert thought was ridiculous and won't even look at is the thing. That's what I think is true, and which is what happens, of course, with flat earth, because all the experts in the world say the opposite. And you realize that, huh, so so I'm smarter or better at I mean, gauging truth than all of these people that I thought were experts. And yeah, yeah of course you are for your truth. I mean, tr like truth, there's objective truth and there's subjective truth, certainly. But as far as what we can get at for what we what makes sense to us, say, is this rather than just like what a lot of people do with experts is like they use jingoistic language, highfalutin terms that maybe we don't even understand. And then we just be like, well, I, I understood about 50 percent of that. And the other 50 percent sounds super smart. So I'm just right. going to believe what the expert says, even though you don't understand it and you couldn't really explain it to somebody else. But you just believe it because of the power of his authority that his authority has over you. Yeah, and why does why do you have to have a lab coat or a degree to, to be the expert? You can any person can go read those books or, or look up material online until they've learned everything about immunology or you know uh, whatever ancient cultures, and now you're the expert on it. It's also a great way to introduce yourself or someone else to logical fallacies and sophistry, uh, the and how people think and how you can actually come to true conclusions because so many people take information that are actually logical fallacies and run with it thinking that it's truth. For example, appeal to authority, the last one we were just talking about. Most people don't don't know that something called appeal to authority is a logical fallacy. It's a it's something that in in formal logic in philosophy class you'll learn that there's it's like 50 or something of these logical fallacies that are arguments that seem convincing um, but if you if you philosophically break them down you realize that they only seemed convincing and that they are completely fallacious for example um, argument from authority appeal to authority such and such an expert says Earth is a globe and blah, 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 blah. Therefore, Earth is a globe, blah, blah, blah. Well, that is a fallacious reasoning because you're just taking that someone is an expert and saying that now everything they say about the thing in their field must be true because they're an expert. Nope, that's called appeal to authority. It's a logical fallacy. It's sophistry. And it's something that many weak-minded people who don't know um, Logic, logic and how they're supposed to think uh, will be influenced by that kind of thing. Another example would be, say, a straw man, a straw man like a, a scarecrow. You set up a straw man argument, which is a fake argument, a false argument that looks like the real man. It looks like the actual argument that somebody might give, but it has a few facts and figures wrong, or, or maybe it's completely different, say, than uh, what the other person says, but it just seems factual. So again, if you don't listen directly to the person who makes the actual argument and you only listen to his detractor who claims that he's uh, giving you his detractor's argument, he very well may be setting up a straw man that just looks like the original argument. And to your undiscerning ears, you go along with it because it seems that way, but then you realize all too late that it was just a straw man and the actual argument looks like this. And when you consider the actual argument, maybe the conclusion is 180 degrees the opposite. And so this is how convincing and deceiving logical fallacies can be. And if you don't know about them, oh. you're going to be deceived by them over and over again. And I think that's why uh, it's been taken out of schools. I only know about logical fallacies because I majored in philosophy in university and it's a elective in philosophy even. I enjoyed it so I took every logic class there was but you wouldn't even as a philosophy major you could just take one logic class and and graduate even. So very few people get a formal education in formal logic and as a result they're swayed by a whole bunch of logical fallacies rather than actual argumentation and actual 
facts and, and truth. Yeah, I think it's that much more dangerous, like you said, when people don't know what they're doing or what they're up against in the in the argument. And it's like if people just we would we would cut so much out of all of that if people could just get to that level. Um, I mean, I, I've no you can just tell. I think you've noticed it too. When people start with their line of questioning after their first or second question, you know exactly how much they've researched. You know exactly how this is going to go, and then I don't. I don't mean to cut some people off, but I'm like, listen, if this is where you're at, like, here's the couple things I should tell you to do, or the video to watch, but you know, message me if you want more. But I'm not. I'm not starting from what. Where's the edge, like anymore? It's 2023. I'm not. I'm not talking about the. You know, and the. Why would they lie? And I, I try to remind people that. What's some of the, what's the line I use? The implications, you know, why is it important and why would they lie? I tell them mm. the, the motive and the implications will not hit you until you're knee deep in objective research. Nice. And, exactly. You know, not just looking into it, Googling it, objective deep research. And that's why I say it that way because it's like it didn't hit me until I was well into it. That's when you realize, wow this really does have implications it's like the foundation of the reality around you you know mm. how we potentially got here and where we could go you know uh, my new favorite one is uh oh why would they why would they lie and i say um well truman was awfully hard to contain when he started getting curious wasn't he <laughs> imagine having eight billion trumans mm. i said you don't if you don't want truman exploring you tell him that there's nothing left to explore. And I feel like that's one of been one of my favorite kind of things lately. I've I've really shifted to kind of trying to like pique people's interest with more land. Mm. You know, whether it be like Admiral Bird or some of these newer maps or these older maps. And I think some people will go, Wow, like, you know, there's more continents out there. And I've noticed that has been um something that can actually hook people. And and I'm, I'm kind of curious your thoughts, and I know how you, you know, try to you stick to a, the very provable pieces of this topic. But do you have any thoughts on some of those like maps with extra continents, or even that that new map that's um, what's his name Nas Confundin or whatever that has the YouTube channel and the books out about the navigator who explored beyond the ice wall? Yeah, um, so. For me, I, I agree that I think getting people to think about the possibility of extra lands and what could be beyond Antarctica is definitely, you know, a focus that we should do because we don't know. There could be anything beyond Antarctica. Us, the general public, us, the new flat earthers, we have no idea. There's probably some people who are in on this deception that know this ultimate truth, but they're not letting it in, letting us know. So the only way the public at large is ever going to get beyond speculation and hearsay, which is all we have right now, is actual full independent exploration of the Antarctic. The last page of my children's book, it shows um, all these planes and mm -hmm. boats all simultaneously going southwards in all directions towards the Antarctic. And uh, at that point in, in the book, the military and and uh, they've um, like there's been so many flat earthers that have made it into positions there that they've said that they're going to stand down and then on this special day everyone just goes out to southbound and um, even the military doesn't go after them uh, because um, it's they want to know the truth as well they want uh, freedom of exploration as well um, as a flat earth mission, say, like for me, I think the, this could be both for flat earthers and globers or, or anyone else. This whole thing can be put to bed in one day. And I wonder what that one day will be. The day is the day that somebody in a plane goes in a straight line for 24 hours. I mean, that's all we need to have happen. It's like, because when you go when you go straight, the globe earthers think if you go straight long enough, they'll come back to where they were. 
<laughs> so as a globe earther, you should want to see this experiment as well to, to prove your, to yourself, just like us flat earthers want to see this experiment because we don't believe that you're going to come back upon yourself. You're going to keep going straight. And even if you don't start southwards, you can go straight in any direction. Eventually, you're going to be going south. And eventually, yeah. you're going to get to Antarctica and whatever may or may not be beyond. Um, you could run into a firmament uh, or some sort of enclosure. The plane could crash and we could find the end of the world. Or we could um, potentially find another pond, of another earth or another area. Or it could potentially go on in darkness and it just gets darker and darker and colder and colder until there reaches some kind of absolute zero, maybe even a different kind of solid that we don't know. Who, who knows what, you know, uh, this is the point is we don't know how the earth terminates. Uh, the globe, what it does is it takes Antarctica, which is a perimeter, and closes it around a ball into this little continent. So now anything that may be beyond Antarctica doesn't exist. <laughs> Conceptually, to people who believe in a globe, it doesn't even exist. And for those of us who know that it's a perimeter rather than a little continent on the bottom of a ball, we want to get to the edge. We want to see what, what is this fence? Does it keep going? Why have they balled it up in our minds? Probably because there is something beyond it. And that's the perfect way to get us to not even care or want to think so. Combine that with an Antarctic treaty that doesn't allow us to go there and all these uh, videos and images that show Antarctica as being somewhere we're probably just going to die of hypothermia if we try to go there. Right. Yet meanwhile, there are accounts of people saying that there's areas in Antarctica that are thermal and, you know, tropical or whatever. That is a possibility that there could be other civilizations or another sun and a moon or something like that beyond. So I'm open to all of that. However, I have a I, I don't like the Nas Confutin map, and I don't like Martin Kenny's three sun, three moon, three ice walls, and thirty three extra continents that nobody's ever seen maps. I don't like these maps because they are speculation and hearsay. Again, we right. we don't know that there's three ice walls and three suns. Or the Nas Confutin one says that there's 178 other Earth ponds. Well, come on now. So <laughs> I agree that um, you know opening people's minds up to think like what could be on there, and I am open to all the possibilities. However, if you present one of the possibilities in a drawing with a map with very specific shapes of continents and, and three ice walls and three suns, three moons, you're making claims now. That's a claim. You don't, and it's a claim that is not backed by anything at all. So there's a, there's a big difference between being open and wanting to push for full exploration. And, you know, I want to see what's beyond the Antarctic just as much as, as anyone else. But pushing these fake maps and models that nobody's ever seen, that nobody could prove and are complete speculation and hearsay uh, in an attempt to to get to these ends. I, I think it's very similar to the bullhorn versus the, the Socratic questioning. If you're going right. to bullhorn a bunch of bullshit, some maps that isn't even real versus just asking questions like, huh, what could we be on? Could there be other ponds? There could be a, there could be many. But why would I say 178? Or why would I say there's three three suns? If I haven't seen three suns or three moons or whatever, you're making claims now, and that's counterproductive. Right. So you got to be you got to be real careful, I think, with that that whole issue. Yes, lead people to curiosity and wanting full exploration. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to push people towards that final page of my children's book. I want to make that happen. But I don't think the way of going about it is promoting a bunch of random maps and models that nobody can prove and saying, see, this, I mean, this, this came out of nowhere in 2021. Some guy named Nas Confudin, whatever that means, he painted a little silly picture of 178 circles. Okay. 
So, you know, that's, yeah. that's kind of how I stand on that. <laughs> yeah. But I will say the Flat Earth, I think my original awakening in 2012 kind of led me to, like, at least explore what was going on spiritually and that there might be something else going on. You know, I was looking into, like, Things like the law of attraction and like consciousness and um, it was just different topics in the rabbit hole. It was like kind of really fascinating about the mind and the universe. It was like, this is not some big accident. And I kind of was already going down that route. And then when I found Flat Earth in 20, I guess, 16 or maybe it was late 15. Yeah, it was late 2015. I was like. This just solidified it for me for there to be a creator because this is obviously an intelligent design and it does really resonate that we are probably the centerpiece of at least, you know, this pond or whatever. Um, so uh, it, I took it there. Concrete, I believe there's a creator, have no background in religion, don't ever approach a flat earth topic from a religious perspective. I kind of just leave that to the others that do that that way and i just uh, not not ever been my thing yeah, I'm, as you're saying that i'm thinking how similar that is to the subject we just talked about in that um i agree that with flat earth and, and other things it it just seems obvious to me that we were created by a purposeful creator designed by an intelligent designer there's just so much in nature that bespeaks to that being the case rather than a random accident that just coalesces into all the beauty and diversity and complexity that we have in the human experience, feelings and consciousness and thoughts. And so it just makes, it only makes sense coming from consciousness, coming from a higher um, consciousness, coming down into where we are rather than starting with material bits of atoms and coalescing until we get these immaterial realities like consciousness and feelings and thoughts and everything. It's like, no, it's definitely the other way. But what a lot of people will do is that so the second they, they get to that realization of, so there must be something bigger than me. It does exist. There is a God or something like that. Then they go right back to whatever they learned as a kid. It's like, oh, okay, so I'm a Christian again. Or oh, now the Bible's true then. Or oh, that's confirming my Muslim belief because uh, in, in the Quran it says that the earth is spread out like a carpet and, oh, okay. And so in in these holy books, uh, it says often that the earth is flat and Hindus will come to me and say the same thing. In the, um, in the Vedas, it also says it can be interpreted both ways more so. Um, and so the people who want to interpret it that way, hey, the earth is flat. See, it says so in here and now I'm reconfirmed in my Hindu faith. Um, but, and, and I'm relating this to say the extra lands and these maps. If I just take a map that with 178 uh, little circles on it and I say, this, this is the reality. I've overstepped my bounds of truth, similar to when I take one book or one religion and I say, this, this is the ultimate truth here because God exists and this, this Bible says God exists and the earth's flat here. So now everything in this book is literal truth because those two things are, are true. You're overstepping your bounds of truth. You, you've found like a little nugget that absolutely you can hold on to. Like I'm saying with the, they're most likely being something beyond Antarctica. At least the picture of Antarctica they've shown us is, is nonsense. So even just you know, if there was a, a firmament or something shortly after the Antarctic coastline and there's not that much that we could explore, well, at least knowing that is huge. That's And we don't know that yet. And so that's the whole point is to get to that level of knowledge rather than just speculation and hearsay. And rather than holding on to something that is clearly at the moment just speculation and hearsay, but giving it a truth verdict because we want to believe that it's true. And that's what people are doing both with the beyond the Antarctic thing, as well as the beyond what human, what we can know how we were created. So we can know, say that we are created and there's intention behind this whole thing. But do we know that it's a benevolent intention? 
most of the world's religions say that the creator is benevolent and we should sing songs to him and praise him and all he needs is that we believe in him and have faith in him and that we'll get to go to the kingdom of God and be in heaven and have eternal bliss after our death. Right. Maybe. I mean, we don't know that, though. That's the big problem I have. You can't just go on something that has not been proven in any way whatsoever and just be like, because that's what the word belief means, I think, is unevidenced acceptance. So if you say you believe in something, what that means basically is you don't know it. If you know it, there's evidence and you accept it based on the obvious evidence that there is for the thing. But when you believe in something, you are admitting that you don't have enough evidence for the thing. But even though it's unevidenced, you're going to accept the thing. And that's my big problem with belief. I don't think anyone should do unevidenced acceptance. What's the point? Why why unevidenced acceptance? Just be in the state of not knowing. If you can't if you can't get enough evidence to get to the state of knowing, then humble yourself to know that you don't know. And this is another pet peeve I have with uh, religious people who tell me that I'm not humbling myself to Jesus or something because I don't have faith. I say that that I am being humble in my position of not knowing. They have an ego trip where they are not being humble and not exercising humility and saying that I know the ultimate truth that's in this book. Well, there's a bunch of books that say they know the ultimate truth, and there's a bunch of people that cling to them and say, this is not, but you don't know that. So you're overstepping your bounds of, of, of knowledge with this word belief. And so, yeah, I just I wanted to uh, go for it. I think it's okay for, that's what I had to understand, is it's okay to not know on something. You can be undecided. I was, when I was, I still haven't looked into the German terrain theory enough to like, give a presentation on it or even send my opinion in an interview, I wouldn't say. So like when people ask me about it, I go, well, I mean, I'll, I'll caveat it with everything you want, but I'm like undecided and I'm okay with that. And when I have like conspiracies that I can't prove, it's okay to say like, yeah, I looked into the cloning thing, but like, I don't know, like, do you believe it or not? I don't know. I don't, I can't prove it. There's a lot of crazy stories this guy, Donald Marshall has and other people, but like, I just, the jury's out. And the jury's out on other things that I haven't done the work on or that I can't prove. And I think that's what's so important that we have to like stick to, like you said, is, you know, stick to what we can prove. You know, when people try to deflect and ask me all these questions about the stars and the comets and all these things. And I'm like, I never once tried to tell you that I know how everything in our world works. I'm just trying to tell you about like curvature of motion, maybe some things about NASA. You have to like re-steer them back in. But, um, yeah, knowing knowing your battle with all that is very important. Another question I had for you, it just kind of came to me while you were talking about, I don't know why, but you were talking about knowing, but how, you know, because I've come across a lot of different people now that in the beginning you would be like, for example, all the pilots know the Earth is flat. And like when you start talking to them, you find out, okay, He had the deer in headlights look. And when I started saying certain things, he was literally going like, you can tell by their response and their their rebuttals that they've literally never thought about it. They don't have the arguments down. You know what I mean? You can just kind of read someone's responses. And then you go to think, these guys have literally just never thought about it. Just like I lived 25 years of my life flying every couple of years and never once thought about the curvature. Same thing with them. So then you get to this point of, okay, well, they really don't know. They're just repeating what they were told. And the same thing for the guy who's building the piece of a satellite and then ships it off to NASA. He believes in the moon landing. He believes in the globe. And then it's like, how far up do you work? So I guess my question, this really long question for you is, at what level do these people actually know, do you think? Because I almost look at people like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and I go do they actually believe what they're saying like I I actually have a thought in my mind that Neil actually might not know Mm. and he really is just such a useful tool so ingrained in his belief so indoctrinated his whole life that it's almost like you said so people are so in that forest that he's the most unlikely person to ever open up to the flat earth 
mm-hmm. and like mm-hmm. he literally does think we're all crazy and there's just no possible way now i know that's unlikely but at what where does it do you think is it that disconnect start where these people these people know and mm-hmm. then it just cuts mm-hmm. off and everyone else is just repeating 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 never thinking outside the box mm, that's a good question it's a I'm, tough one because we yeah, can speculate yeah. here too right yeah, we can't know exactly the answer because we're not them. I have assumed people like Carl Sagan and Neil Tyson are part of the big club that you and I ain't in. And <laughs> as a result, they know what they're doing and they're, um, you know, they know both models, say, and they're reading off their script and doing their job. Though, right. yeah, I mean, I would definitely leave open a slim possibility that they could just be so in it and perhaps hand-picked by people who know because they just see that, oh, this guy's completely, you know, buys it and he's he's maybe the per- perfect personality type to continue the deception. I don't know exactly how the hand-pickers and pluckers and movers do their thing, but that's it's definitely played like a chessboard and a lot of the people on the chessboard don't realize that they're being played that way, right. though very difficult to say like you're asking where where's that cutoff line between the the people who you know use their hands to move the chess pieces and who are just the chess pieces <laughs> right it's like where does the handler start and the puppet begin <laughs> almost mm-hmm. like and I've, I've it's always intrigued me because i start to meet people and i'm like or i'll confront certain people and you get questions like for instance, this girl who just responded in the NASA article, I've been trying to get in touch with her. Uh, they, 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 you know, the ISS speech I did, they, NASA responded and they gave this girl, she's like 28, she was an intern, and now she just reads scripts. Mm-hmm. And I know that she's never thought twice about anything, but I've been, but she's young. So I've been like, she's got to have social media, right? What 28-year-old girl doesn't have social media? And typically, a NASA representative, you're never going to get their phone number or email or get in touch with them. And I tried. I couldn't find her anywhere, but I found all her social media. So I'm like, okay, the world has changed a little. I can find this back door in. I can't get her to accept any of my friend requests or follows or nothing. Mm. So I don't know if she's, if she's on to it or if she's just not paying attention yet. But it's really hard to get to these people. But... I have this like, I don't know, maybe I'm being naive, but I have this like confidence that I can almost like get to one of them and get one of them to either quit or blow the whistle or tell me something, some great information that we didn't know. Um, like a Cindy Holland, what was that woman? She worked for NASA and overheard people talking about the moon landing being fake. Like maybe we get another story like hers and we can add to these and maybe corroborate them. But it's just a it's just a weird game and sometimes I've I've really challenged people and then I come to find out like this guy's this guy's not in on it. He's just an idiot. Like mm-hmm. our, uh, oh the medical director. You know, when I, I confronted him twice and when I questioned him about the vaccine and he was just like, What are you talking about? And I was like, You really don't know. And I'm thinking, You've gotta know. But like you said, that he's they're like, All right, this guy's great at following orders. He's never bucked the system. He's never thinks for himself. Promote him. Make him the medical director. And then they move him up there, and now he is, like, just flying colors, whatever they want him to do. And then someone like me comes up to him on his way into work one day and shows him all this stuff, and he's, like, never seen any of this before. And it's just crazy to me how how it all works. And I think it really sheds light into people say, well, everybody wouldn't be able to keep this secret look at how many useful tools and idiots they have for them, you know, from a medical director to a NASA spokesperson, you know, these people really are, they believe what they're saying. A lot of them, you know, I guess it's, it's easier to conceal a conspiracy. You have these people doing the bidding unknowingly, you know, they're not like, ha I'm, I'm tricking and poisoning these children. You know, the most pediatricians are like, got to get your shots or you might get sick. You know, they, they really believe that line. Um, they're not like Dr. Evil over here. There may be some, but they're the, the Peter Hotez and the Dr. Fauci. They're not your, your average pediatrician. All right. Yeah, it definitely works to keep, um, like, if you were, if you, all of your agents, say, were knowingly lying all the time, 
for sure it would come across that way because you know facial gestures and stuff people are easily able to pick up on these kind of things and you're right a lot a lot of the um, authority figures in a lot of these fields do just seem like true believers and and that really is the perfect um, middleman between mm-hmm. between you and the people that you're trying to influence is a true believer that which they may be in your organization. So what makes sense to me, maybe combining both, is that people like Sagan and Tyson probably are Freemasons, as I'm saying. However, the way Freemasonry works with the degrees and everything, and you, you just slowly become illuminated and you learn different things, basically they, they, based on what you learn from your own research, they pluck you and put you in an appropriate degree. And the more you figure out, the higher you're going to make it. But if you don't figure it out, then you're going to be a, a useful idiot in a lower degree doing you know, some job like this, for instance. And if you truly believe the thing, you're much more effective at it than somebody who is actually knowingly lying. And it's, much, it's difficult if you're knowingly lying and saying the opposite thing. If you know all the flat earth facts, you know the earth is actually flat and everything, and then you have to be the glober 24-7 it would be quite difficult and so yeah Yeah. you're right i wonder if it may be a combination of these things where they are they are in the group that's how they get on the world stage and become the the popular person they are but they may not be so fully in the know as someone like myself uh, has assumed for so long because that does make a lot of sense that it's better both for for them and us so to speak that they can disavow it so if at some point say Neil Tyson does figure it out. Whoa, whoa the Earth is flat. And stuff. Well, they can just take away his platform and his, th- and you know, him for example. I think he's got three current allegations against him um, that are in the the media. All they got to do is push those or whatever, and you know they can. He's out. He's out. So I think they, the way that these secret societies work is often like this, where they have something over their member, they promote you. But you know that they've got this thing over your head, like the sword of Damocles. And at any time, if you go against the party line, and you know if you know that the party, you may think that the party line is the truth. But if you realize at some point that the party line isn't the truth, and you try to go off it, well, the hand that plucked you and brought you to where you are is now going to pluck you off that chessboard and kick you to the curb. So yeah, you know what? That does make a lot of sense. That um, I bet a lot of these people are in the club. But they're yeah. not necessarily in the know. You make a good point with that. Like, there's like almost two sections. There's like the in the know club, and there's the out of the know club. And it's those useful tools that are in the out of the know. And they're just like, yeah, just keep them over there. They'll always deny it. They're never going to look like they're lying. They truly, and those are probably the people that like, you know, idolize the system or like idolize the president. They're like, oh, I get to work for the White House. You know, I'm the White House spokesperson. And, they truly believe all that crap. I guarantee that White House, that's probably a good example, that those White House spokespersons that come out and you know answer the questions for the press, those people are guaranteed not in the know. They're just, we're so eager to get a job like that and they're so proud of it and they tweet about it and they take pictures and they just, they believe it so much. But you get three layers above them and that person's like, yeah, we're never letting them get up here because they can't. They'd never keep their mouth shut. If they learned everything we know, they'd probably crumble. They'd probably tell their family. They, they, you know, they, they do. They probably analyze people on how well, how much they're hoodwinked by it, how well they can keep secrets, and then they can probably tear them that way. Um, but I tell you what, man, Neil, Neil's an interesting one. What do you make of his? Do you call it damage control? I guess that's what I call it when. He's sort of come out and explained the Red Bull jump, kind of like for our favor. And then he came out and explained the Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson one, the space flight, like 60 miles high, and also explained it in a way on the news. It was kind of just, it was weird. Maybe they don't have a choice and they have to damage control it and say that they're not seeing curvature. But, you know, this has been one of the questions, if I get the chance to confront him, I want to ask him, you know, how do you explain watching boats go over the curve from the ground? But yet, if you pull me 60 miles high, 
you're telling me that I can't fathom seeing it. You can't have it both ways. And that's what I want to ask him. But I'm curious your thoughts. What do you think he's doing with that explaining how there's that's a fisheye lens, dude? Like, what, why is he going to those lengths to do that? I, I think it's absolute damage control because they never used to talk that way, but now right. it's like, and they never used to mention Flat Earth, but ever since Flat Earth became a thing, it's like every time you see Neil Tyson, he's talking about Flat Earth now. So clearly, you know, this is a damage control topic. They understand that they need to curtail this movement that's happening, and they're doing uh things like this to do so. And I, and I think when he says stuff like, that stuff is flat, and that's just a fisheye lens, he's, he's saying the things we are saying because he has to. If he keeps toting the party line that, like you said, uh, you know, the, oh, the curvature happens at sea level and the ships are going over it, yet at 60 miles high when we can see for hundreds of miles and the horizon's still flat and at eye level, like, oh yeah, seeing ships over that curvature I mean, it's, it's ridiculous so they're having to he's having to update his rhetoric to saying stuff like oh well if you're you know if this is the globe you're only like two millimeters over the surface and it's like my finger and he gives all these tyson style analogies that are now updated to counter the flat earth rhetoric basically. So it does sound like he's saying similar things to what we're saying, but all he's doing, I think, is moving. He's trying to make it seem like, uh, well, you're not high enough. You're not far enough off of this little you're two yeah. millimeters off the globe. And so he's saying these kind of things like, yeah, of course it's flat. Of course that's a fisheye lens, because they're trying to make you think that you have to go out to outer space before you can see any evidence of their globe, which is why your question is brilliant because they are making the exact opposite claim at the, the same time, time <laughs> saying that oh look yeah. it's going over the curve what curve <laughs> i know i've literally got the clip of bill nye doing the little boat model and it goes over it and then it just cuts to neil and he's like you you can't see curvature from that height and i'm like hmm. this is this would be brilliant i actually waited at an event i was going to try to get in but i couldn't I couldn't pull it off. He's kind of a hard one to get in front of. I will say, though, his interview with Del Bigtree really exposed. you got to watch that one, man. It, it, there's so many takeaways from it. Now, they talked about vaccines and the pandemic, but he it really exposed his tactics and his pathetic. You know how it is. Once you see his ways, you can't unsee it. Makes you want to pull your hair out. He's either deflecting to a corny joke or using some fantastical far out left field analogy that has nothing to do and he, he does this awkward laugh in between and it's just so obvious and he did it all with Dell and I, I was like very active in the comments under the videos and the reposts of it and people were like oh I really thought Neil was a smart guy he should stick to the space and I was you know well wait till you find out about that <laughs> and I'm like yeah wait till you hear yeah he's completely full of it on everything and I would <laughs> So many people were seeing Neil for what he was, and I think it just helped us so much because, like we all know, he's a leading voice in that space science topic, and um, it was proven to show that he was full of it. And he did the thing. What did he say? He really shot himself in the foot. I'll send you my post, but he said um, Dell really cornered him on the vaccine, and he goes, "Dude, I'm a I'm a consensus scientist, man. I, I just repeat the consensus." And I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Like, no shit, that's what you do. And then that's what we all have been saying is you don't actually read the data. You don't actually look at what we're saying. If you did, it would be exposed. It would be all out there. And um, it's a good one. You'll have to check it out. Uh, it doesn't do him any favors, and it just will help people understand that uh, maybe he's full of crap on the other stuff he's talking about, too. Mm. Interesting. What about what do you think about Elon Musk? Do you where do you think he's on the chessboard or is he does he have his hand picking people? It seems like he would have to be in the know. Otherwise, there's just too much going on in his organization. I'm like I'm with him. I'm with like with Neil deGrasse Tyson. There's like this 90 to 95 percent chance that they're definitely in the know, but I'm leaving that small window of they're just. Mm. It's just really hard. I mean. Uh, Elon was, you've got the strange book from 
von Braun about yeah. someone colonizing oh, someone in Elon. Yeah. That's a really weird coincidence to me. You've got um, him championing things like, you know, Neuralink and the World Economic Forum. I don't know. He, he gives me like another QAnon vibes. Like they're sending in a new savior that's mm-hmm. preaching this free speech, but he was like, everyone can come back to Twitter. Well, except Alex Jones and this person and this person and this. That's not free speech. And then 5G satellites. I mean, there's so many things that are a wrong. Te- with him, but... A Tesla in space. And then he says the pictures, you, you know, they're real because they look so fake. So fake. To me, right. that seems like somebody who knows it's fake and he's doing damage control. Nice. So like even more so, say, than Carl Sagan or Neil Tyson. I feel like yeah. Elon Musk is he's like he seems to be the guy that they put out there similar to Richard Branson to give the idea that independent space travel is a thing if you're rich enough but of course if you're as rich as these guys you're probably in these big masonic clubs and whatnot and you're controlled in another way but in yeah, that way it's, it's worked because as you know a lot of the argument we get is oh well, there's not just NASA you know there's civilian space organizations they can't all right. be doing lying and faking and I think that's part of it I, I got interviewed by someone a long time ago when Elon sent that car into space and they asked me about him and I was like you know I don't have any proof but my gut tells me he was probably plucked and put into this position and knows what's going on we have this other weird kind of good thing happening with the truth movement I use this example of like let's say 10 years ago a conspiracy theory about Madonna came out I feel like it was very rare or it was very slow to get to her to where like she may not have even heard about it. You know, the internet wasn't as popular. YouTube wasn't viral with these TikToks and all these things. And it was just never even addressed. And nowadays, I feel like not only does that information get back to like the celebrity, but it gets back to them almost instantly. Like they're getting tagged in all their social media. They're being sent the video. More people are sending it to them and they have to address it faster. So, like, we can almost get to these people quicker. For instance, Elon Musk follows Luke Rudowski of Mm. We Are Change and Aaron Elizabeth of Health Nut News, two people I'm pretty close with. And I'm like, they're seeing his tweets now. How long before they retweet me and Elon Musk sees something I'm doing? Mm. Like, we we are getting so much closer to these people. And, for instance, Elon will have to respond to things on Twitter now. Well, what if he gets a bunch of flat earth comments one day? We're going to get some engagement. Mm. Um, it's just a really weird uh, like kind of environment that we're in right now. Twitter has enabled people to get really close to famous people and celebrities. And um, whether you're challenging them or trying to cancel them or ask them a hard question, it's just like I have more hope than ever, you know, that we can get to some of these people maybe. Maybe it's their assistant. Maybe it's them. But... Hell, if we don't send them running with their tail between their legs, maybe we can get them to blow the whistle. Yeah. I just read um, Ted Kaczynski's second book. Um, I'd I'd read his first, which is about industrial society and its future, and about the problems of technology and how technology and government always kind of come together and create less and less freedom for people. And his second book is called Anti-Tech Revolution, How and Why. And it's he's been in prison for the past 30 years, basically just reading, reading up on revolutionary movements and what he calls self-propagating systems and self-propagating groupings and how they eventually come to power and um, make change in the world. And he has like a few premises about He thinks now that actually the anti-tech revolution, meaning that the eventual failure of all technology um, is inevitable. (laughs) Uh, Before he he was obviously thinking not so much along those lines that we really need a lot of planning and and, and all these different things need to happen before uh, it comes to like this end game scenario like in Terminator or something where the robots and the AI and the machines just have so much power that humans just become slaves and there's no chance for rebellion against the robotic system, the technocracy. Now he's thinking more that 
basically because he's done like he, he looked into the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, feminism, um, the Green Party. He, he's looking in at any what he calls self prop systems. So things like anywhere from religions, he's looking at religions to political parties to social movements like feminism and all these things and how their successes and their failures and what we can learn from them if we want to have a successful anti-tech revolution or or a pro-environmental revolution he's also into that you know getting back to nature or we can use these things that he's talking about for things like flat earth or any other t subject that we want to try and bring awareness to and basically what he's saying is that there's no system in history that's ever you know gained full control and then there's never an outlier or outlying groups that are able to then usurp that control and bring you know bring the power over to their side and he's basically saying that eventually when he gets to the point of the new world order one world technocracy uh because things get so inter interlocked and then similar to the grains of sand falling out of your hand analogy he says what inevitably happens is that usually over years or decades of the grains of sand falling out they start to raise their voices they start to make their own self-propagating groups and systems that are against the overarching system but there's not a time yet the, the key element is time there has to be some event or some like mass tipping point thing that happens and then when that event happens suddenly these self-propagating systems like say you know the bolsheviks during that revolution uh the timing happens in which their their thing that they've been wanting to have happen for so long but haven't had the power to do it because the event happens now they can do it and so he's showing how our job if we want to change the world if we want revolutions if we want new concepts to take priority in the mainstream consciousness we have to set up self-propagating systems that and and keep pushing them with the knowledge that there's a future time in which your power will manifest itself and that you don't necessarily have all that power right now you're building it uh, for flat earth for example i've thought of it as say the project blue beam if that were to happen say and the entire world is confronted now with this idea of alien life or potentially off world things so now the the mindset of the whole world is focused on space or the earth and stuff and suddenly the flat earth message now becomes a you know rather than just being some random weird thing that oh i got to go to work in the morning why would i well after project blooming maybe you don't have to go to work in the morning you can't go to work in the morning they shut the world down similar to the last thing and then uh now during that event say during that time this self-propagating group the flat earth community the flat earth movement that has had only minimal success up until then suddenly has this window of opportunity where they get to like the whole world might suddenly be confronted say with flat earth information and you you reach a tipping point where pretty much everybody except for you know somebody in the desert somewhere that has no media or somebody who has an IQ under 60 or something everyone else just gets it then is and now that we live in a flat earth world where everybody knows the globe is ridiculous nasa can no longer continue elon musk can no longer do his thing we're no longer going to pay taxes to these organizations that are you know stealing our money to go into outer space and give us cgi pictures and fish eye lenses and all this stuff so that's we want that to happen or with the the expedition outward that i said from my children's book I want to see that day and all it takes is 24 hours all it takes is some intrepid pilot to just do it uh, maybe or maybe it takes a few because the military is going to come and come in who knows we might, but, need, we might need an unmanned plane if it's going to hit something that's a very good <laughs> idea yeah drones uh, with that technology now and with live uh, film we can have right. like live 
footage coming from an unmanned drone even. That doesn't so that, even cost human life. That We could do that fairly easily. We, don't, we could crowdfund that, honestly. Hey, Globers, want to shut up every flat earther forever? You could do it in 24 hours. It's, it's so easy. All you got to do is go in a straight line, like we're saying. Come back to your starting point. Live stream the whole thing. And when they get shot down by the military, then we'll have a story and say, see, we told you, you can't do it. And again, and then that brings your self-propagating system to its peak where suddenly it's a world issue that everybody's looking at. And now you have the opportunity that you didn't have the past 10 years to suddenly on a dime convert everyone. So Kaczynski's book is, is saying basically that um, eventually the, the, the marriage of technology and government has to fall apart because it becomes so interconnected that uh, it's easy to dismantle, like shut down the whole system, for example, like an EMP or something, or rather than if technology and, and everything wasn't so interconnected, it might not be a big deal. But if you if you have an EMP when, you know, everyone's bank account is, you know, paper money doesn't exist anymore. We're all on the digital. You've got RFID everything and d digital eye scans to get yourself into a, a bank or a business or whatever. And, and then poof, EMP. Well, suddenly we would just be right back to the state of nature. You'd literally have to go back to barter because cash doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like, so what he's what he's saying is that it's it's going to get to this point where suddenly there will be a necessary revolution that will just happen out of natural disaster even or who knows what but there will there will come a time where the anti tech powers will become all powerful and the all powerful new world order government technocracy that truly was all powerful and inescapable and created this slave like system will fall as all empires have fallen in history. Um, it's just, but what we can do, and so the, moving on, the next chapter is saying, okay, well, we need to speed the fall though. And we wanna, because the, the quicker it happens, the less devastating it's gonna be to everyone. Because the more interconnected everything, the whole world is with, with communication and transportation and everything, if it goes down, you know, it really brings us back so what we want to do instead is start um, uh, propagating these self-propagating ideas, concepts, systems, such as off-grid living, homesteading, getting back to nature and planting your own food, um, you know, fruit, fruit forests and uh, permaculture. These kind of things are what we should be promoting, doing, but ultimately because it's just this guy over here, that guy, it's, it's so decentralized the one central system still has that overarching authority and drive and power that all these little decentralized rebels can't really do much they're the little grains of sand but the but the thing is you don't have to you don't have to despair and he's saying this is the important thing is don't despair in these years or decades leading up to the moment because that's what people do. They'll go for five years or something and they'll burn out and they'll be like, I haven't been effective. I'm not going to do activism anymore and go back to their mainstream life or something. But what you were doing, you were building something. You were pushing a snowball down a mountain. It was mm -hmm. gaining size and speed. And then, but rather than realizing that, you kind of in the moment, you saw that, well, no, well, nobody's changing. This guy doesn't believe me. The world's not. I don't really have the power. Rather than seeing the future. For, for what it will be and has to be, because that's the thing with the truth. The lies require infinite amount of propaganda and re-propping up, and, and you have to keep saying the lies over and over again. Meanwhile, the truth doesn't even need to be spoken a single time. It just, it's there, behind all the lies, shining bright, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and if all that it really needs to do is the propaganda has to stop, and if people could just be back to the state of nature, then they would just see the truth, which is, that's the brilliance of it is and all that and if we are standing in truth then that's all we're doing is 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 that and waiting for the moment when we can really shine because those things in in the way have disappeared you could even do anonymous forms of activism for people who are scared of losing their job or aren't confident to put their face on things 
you can do like sticker activism and um, or business leaving business cards or posters. Um, you could do uh, a video channel that only uses your voice or only uses text and images even. So there's a bunch of ways that you can be effective in creating the kind of social, political, or whatever change that you um, would like to see in the world without even having to put your name or face to it. And so that's a great way to be effective. Or you can push other people's material. You know, people who uh, you, you like their material, then that's another way you can do it. So even basically there's, there's no excuse, there's no reason that anyone should not you know, have social, what do you call it, you know, act activism, I guess, be a part of your life. Like, if you believe in something, meaning if you, <laughs> not the other kind of belief, meaning if you, um, what, what do I mean by that? That's, that's interesting with that, when that word belief comes into this type it's of... It's funny, because I did it earlier, and I was like, I don't want to use that word, because I know that that doesn't mean I know it. Right. But I didn't know another word to put in there. For your case right here, I would just say when you're when you're really passionate about something. Good, thank you. And yeah, when you're passionate, or you, or even if you don't believe, but you you feel that something needs to be exposed, or attention should be driven towards a certain subject, you don't even need to make a truth claim about it. But by doing activism, even indirect or anonymously, at least you. You have that feeling, and it, it makes you feel less depressed. That, that was that um, statement I was making in an earlier video. How, for me, the thing that really cured my truth or depression after I first came to all of these realizations. You know, it's really angering and saddening to realize that the world isn't how you thought it was growing up. You know, kind of you live in the ro with rose-colored glasses, and you think that. But you don't know that there's so many deceptions and so much evil in the world and when you come to that realization um, it's depressing and you feel powerless and all that and so the way to get out of that slowly is is by actually doing this kind of activism i would recommend not being anonymous and being direct and putting your face right out there if you can if you have that level of confidence in the subject you're doing then that's definitely the way to do it but i'm also saying if you're not there yet the best way to start is like this. I mean, I basically did that. I started with a blog and I was mostly promoting David Icke and Alex Jones, who I thought at the time were saying things that, and they were, I mean, at that time, that was about the best you could get for getting people to wake up to a bunch of these conspiracy type subjects. Um, over time, I, I started trusting their voice and, and liking their videos less and less and started in putting in my own two cents more and more to the point that I stopped basically promoting <clears throat> any known figures in the conspiracy community and just it became my own authority, which is like I said, everyone should do eventually. It's like, yeah, at first you do your research, you find some people you agree with, you look at all their information, eventually you might find some things you disagree with, and then you start building up your own authority and your own worldview, and, and it starts to have merit and then you can start showing that to other people and sharing and expanding. And now suddenly, you know, uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, back when I started, David Icke and Alex Jones are like my heroes and they're like famous or whatever. Now people say my name in the same breath as them and they think I'm just as famous as, as them or more famous because they think I'm genuine and they're shills or something. And it's like, Wow, <laughs> that feels good, and that's an amazing thing to go from, to go from just Eric on my blog sharing Alex Jones clips to now people being like, oh, I trust Eric. I don't trust Alex. And it's like, whoa, I, I eclipsed my previous hero. You know, even in my in my mind, uh, after listening to him for years, I started finding things that I didn't agree with, and he be soon became my anti-hero. <laughs> Because, um, right. you know, at some point, you, you almost think that, is he a gatekeeper? He almost seems like that more so than a genuine guy that's trying to, you know, uh, relate all these conspiracy information. It's because of the way he does it, some of the certain things he says, some things are clear disinformation. And again, you get, in your mind, you get that thing like we were saying earlier about, it's like, is he 
on the chessboard or is he a hand? How knowing is he of what he's doing? Right. I wonder about Alex. He's a similar. I mean, I really think he knows. I think he's really in it. I think he is a gatekeeper. Um, but I think, uh, I, I'd leave a little, a little thing there that perhaps maybe he totally believes it, and he's just being handled, and he's in one of the clubs, but uh, doesn't know fully how how it all works. I don't know. It's really difficult. It's like that question of motive or whatever. Why the lie? It's like you're, I'm not in these people's heads. There's really exactly. no no way I can answer that question 100%, but it is fascinating, and I do wonder myself. Yeah, I think I, I kind of go back to that with people. when If I start to get into it with people about who's so-called controlled or not, I'm like, at the end of the day, we're like, we are kind of debating someone's intentions that we've never met and probably never will. And it's like, we could focus on the main things here. Yeah, it's okay to talk about them. I and obviously you're going to, if there's, you know, big names in certain topics, it does need to be addressed. But I think going back to what you said, like my buddy Steve Grant, who said it once to me, he was like, because we've had plenty of talks about how, oh, I can't believe so-and-so, you know, won't talk about, the, or won't do this, or so-and-so still, how does this person still support, a, you know, the President Trump or whatever it is? And, and like, Steve would be like, dude, you've got to remember, like, we've kind of lapped these people, you know? Like, I know we used to look up at them as, like, you know, heroes. Like, you talk about Alex and David. I have the same, you know, feelings because when I first got into this, they were, like, the main guys. And you're mm. looking, and they, they explain it well, and they tell you how, how it all works. And you're like, wow, this is really – and then you do. You kind of put people on this pedestal, and then you have to realize, okay, just like I did with – famous people just like i did with others this is they're just regular people and everyone's at a part of their journey um i don't know the jury's still out with me on alex i it's weird it's like the more mutual friends i get with people the more i start to like lean into this benefit of the doubt like i used to say alex got the call one day and was like yep i'll, I'll stop here i'm good i'll do whatever you all say but one i don't think it's very black and white i think it's very like a crazy dynamic with different people like maybe some people get the call or the pushback in a very like indirect way and they don't even really know who or why or how it came but they just know they started to shut up um and maybe other people literally get the call from their like their handler and they're like yo man you you literally broke the one thing i told you not to do you need to don't ever do that again or else it's going to be real bad i don't know how it goes but like because of Luke, because of Eddie Bravo, um, who else? There's a couple other people that I'm like, maybe, maybe Alex is, um, you know, just like he did plateau at his journey. And I think some people get into such a bubble of like, oh, I'm a big name and I've got assistance and they don't ever truly look into anything anymore. So like when Alex got so big and so busy and so popular, if Flat Earth came across his desk, that guy's never going to have the time or be able to put his ego to the side to say, oh, here's this new topic that I missed. Um, I'm Alex Jones. How did I miss one of the truth topics? The biggest one of all? There's no way. Like, There's got to be a very big ego battle there. So assuming he's not in the know and totally controlled, like, I don't know. I wonder if he is just like plateaued and he's probably gotten a phone call before, but maybe he is really still trying to do the right thing. His interview with Sam Tripoli, Eddie Bravo, and somebody else on InfoWars once about Flat Earth kind of gave me some insight because he was very ignorant to some of the points. And I was like, this guy's never looked into it. Like, he, he was doing the, you know, what about the, this, you guys say there's an ice wall. What about the edge? And I'm like, he's no, he really. He deleted that video a few days after afterwards, too. It was only up on InfoWars for a few days. Oh, and he took it down? Yeah. Oh, interesting. See, and I, and I always wondered about, like, so what level of understanding is he at? I don't know. I have hope. I get hope because of people, like I said, mutuals, like an Eddie Bravo. And they'll say, no, man, I know the guy, and he just doesn't get it. And I'm like, hey, I pray you're right, because if, that, if that's the case, we can still get to them. And those are the people that I'd still love to get to. But if it's not the case, then it's a lost cause. He's just it's sold out. <laughs> Like I said, ultimately, we can't know who the shills are. We don't get the pay stubs. We don't know the handlers. We can only make assumptions. The thing we can do, though, is we can assess lies and disinformation. 
And that, I think, are the two things that point towards whether someone is a shill or at least point towards the fact that they're not trustworthy and, and maybe not so much worth listening to or paying so much attention to. The more you can catch someone out in a proven lie or disinformation so that you know that they're saying something that you can prove the opposite, but they won't stop saying this thing. Those are the things that I think, you know, we can talk about though, rather than trying to be like, is Alex a shill? The, the better thing you could say is, well, Alex has lied about this and, you know, he keeps saying this thing, but we can prove that this is the opposite. And then you can build up, say, a list of things like that. And now that list that you've built of lies and disinformation and untrustworthy things that Alex has done, or maybe his like fake crying on 9-11, I don't know what you'd classify that as, acting. So you have all these certain things in there. And uh, now you have, say, a case against the person, or you have at least concrete things that we can point to that um, you could bring up to him in an interview. If somebody gets to talk to him, hey, what about this, that, and the other thing? And, that, and whatever, however he responds to those things will probably let you know if he's a shill or not. And, and it'll, you know, it would be so much more productive to have that list and to discuss that list rather than always just talking about the shill or not. It's like black and white issue. What I'm saying is here's a list of 50 shades of gray that you can, you can talk about and you can even maybe get him to address versus are you a shill? I hear you're a shill, Alex. I think Alex is a shill. It's like the that whole rhetoric, that whole line of of just finger pointing. Um, even though that is the ultimate, that's what you're doing. <laughs> ultimate, you know, it's the end conclusion. You, it's almost not worth talking about that point. That end conclusion is a conclusion you can never fully reach. The only thing you can do is reach these fifty shades of gray. I'm saying, and that's what we should be focusing on, rather than the ultimate conclusion we can never reach. Yeah, I think that's a safe way to do it is to really just drill down. And that's what I tell people, you know, is, well, then why do you think that person's controlled? And then they give me some reasons. And if they if they tell me, oh, well, they one time got a you know a media interview and there's no way they'd ever let them on TV. And I'm like, OK, well, I was on know, TV. It's so. like there's this, we do have this issue in the com in the truth community or whatever you want to claim or represent. But people are they throw around the controlled opposition when it's convenient when they either disagree with someone on how they do activism or they 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 it's almost like they're so pessimistic and i don't know what the right word maybe is but like they think everything's so controlled and we'll never get any wins so like if i were to get on tv for like a local news interview they'll be like oh he's controlled i knew, I knew he was a shill yep. yeah because that proves they it never, they control every network and every journalist and everything they'll never let anyone on tv it's like well that's not they, like I always use the what's the Bob Marley line like you can fool some people some of the time they control some things sometime but not all the things all the time you're gonna have leakers you're gonna have things slip into the mainstream so like to say that someone got a bit of a following like oh well Eric Dubay is popular he's a show or Justin got a media interview he's a show or I, I just it's such an irresponsible thing and I find a lot of times we just have like disagreements with people on how their like their delivery is or their activism and you're like oh well, they must be controlled because they use a bullhorn well it's like well maybe he's just an idiot and doesn't know how to do this yet and hasn't figured it out and uh, maybe he's just a loud mouth and that's the only thing he knows yeah I've actually had it recently with someone um, what was it I think it's because I have two Facebooks and uh, they saw me in the new Hibbler film and like looked me up and I guess I had a different name and they, they, they like friended me and post my page and he was like I'm keeping an eye on this one and I was like well this is interesting let me just head this off quick and I come and I was like what are we keeping an eye on exactly and he was like well what's your real name and I was like I got two Facebooks one's for you know my personal life one's for activism one uses my middle name one uses my last name and I was like any other questions and, da -da -da -da. and I'm like you know this person was ready to start screenshotting my page and be like we've got a shell and doing all these things and I'm like this is what we just got to pump the brakes on, you know, like these discussions, like a lot of times you have a discussion with someone, you'll find out that he was like, oh, OK. And I told him, I said, man, if you knew the types of harassment and like attacks and trolling I get, you may have 
two Facebooks as well. Um, and uh, I think then he understood, and it was just kind of funny. You know, I didn't block the guy or anything, but it was just kind of an interesting way it played out. Yeah. Uh, if we can engage with some of the people, then that is what might happen. But then at the same token, it's like these are the people you least want to engage with. Somebody that comes out with an accusation based on nothing and then they're making videos or hit pieces and stuff. It's like, yeah, I don't really want to engage with those people either. Um, but eventually I've had to make like anti hit piece videos about you know, Eric Dubay exposed or not because they make all these claims about you that you know are false. And then all these people keep coming at you like, Eric, I heard you got $100,000 in a vaccine injury settlement uh, in Maine. I don't know if you've heard that one. Like, if you look into, oh yeah, uh, they made this whole web of conspiracy where there's a guy from Maine named Eric Dubay, but oh. he's about ten, he's ten years older than me. I found him on Facebook, and he was injured in a vaccine injury, and he got a hundred thousand dollar settlement, and people have made videos and stuff saying that was Eric Dubay's like underground payment that he received to become the the flat Earth guru or whatever. And so they're putting two and two together like this this hundred thousand dollar payment was my cia money or something that i got based on a fake vaccine injury uh, uh, jamie lee from a plain truth he put that in his book and i just saw a video. he's still saying this to this day he keeps talking about this exact thing and there's a whole bunch of other arguments like um the prince of monaco andrea kasagi looks somewhat like me and they're like it's Eric Dubay. He's playing a, a role. Uh, Eric is actually the Prince of Monaco. And so there's a bunch of stuff like this, these conspiracies, and there's websites, videos, you know, dedicated to this, and they keep coming up. There was J Jamie Lee just put out a new video saying the same thing. I have screenshots, uh, you know, I've, I've the proof to show that this is not me. This is another guy with the same, there's three Eric Dubays from Maine alone. I mean, I don't know how many Eric Dubays there are in the world, but so they're just you wonder if these people are like if some of this stuff is planted to cause confusion and doubt in the movement but then you find some that are literally just people that are i don't know if they just want i think there's this like human nature to want to to want to like figure something out first and be like oh i've got this inside scoop i've got the breaking news on on your favorite truther i've finally exposed i always do that joke i'm like how many times am I going to see the all caps, like, finally exposed, finally exposed, and it's just, here's my opinion on this person I don't like, and <laughs> finally exposed is the tagline I'm getting you in here with, but it's just, um, it's funny to see, but going back to your other point on, like, you know, I, I'm guilty of it, too, you know, as soon as you wake up, I think we get these, these glasses on, these other glasses, and we're like, oh, well, if you can't see it like me, you've got to be in on it because I can see it now. But little did I know, I was six weeks ago, I didn't know it. I didn't get it. So was I a shill when I was asleep? No, I just didn't see it yet. And I had to I had to snap out of that for years, probably in the beginning, I would be like, you know, well, this person clearly is, you know, in on it, because there's no way that they could have just been thinking about space this long. They're, they must know. And then you, you meet them, or you confront them, and they're like, deer in the headlights look like scott kelly different exception he knows but you get lower levels down and you're like oh wow they really don't know like mm -hmm. i've been saying it's just uh it's just a whole it's just a different realization and i kind of just have a little i pump the brakes a little bit more like you said some of the hasty conclusions i just wait and i, I told people hey man if you if you want to theorize about someone without proof that's fine, but just give it time. I think in due time, we'll either, the truth will show itself. They'll either get, we'll trip them up, they'll either fade to black and we'll go, oh, that person must have been, they just came in, stirred, stirred up a bunch of drama and then left. Maybe they were. Um, but I don't think the guys that have stuck around for 20 years that you just simply were debating with on one topic, yet you guys are aligned on the other eight, that person's not the shill. Y'all just disagree, you know, on right. whatever it is. I don't know. I, I scroll past them now. The This this or that exposed. Look, he's got 33. Right. His latest video ends with 33 seconds. Right. I get that one a lot. It's like this. <laughs> it's I've got like 400, 400 or 500 videos on my channel. 
there's only a 60 there's only 60 seconds so like the the odds right. are that i'll have about five or six videos that are going to end with 33 <laughs> you know but right. rather than rather than think of those odds every time I, I you know there's a video that ends in 33 or 13 it's like why did you end the video at 13 seconds eric and the other funny thing is like when you upload often the, it'll be one second more or less than it is on your video editor yeah yeah so, yeah so I'll, I'll usually i'll notice it i know i don't want to see your stupid comments so <laughs> if i see that it's 13 or 33 <laughs> seconds i will put it to 34 or 32 or something and then you upload it and it goes back to 33 and then you get the comments and you're like ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's just inevitable i think with some people and the imagination. I mean, can you really blame blame us? I mean, we live in a world of constant deceit and lies, and people are always trying to pull one over on us from your robocall scammers to your government. I mean, I can't really blame people for... And we tell people to question everything and be skeptical. So, like, I can't get mad at everyone, but I, I do. It's like the unfounded ones. It's using it, throwing it around too much when there's just disagreements. Um... I'm all for the other one. So I had a guy, Dr. Kevin Falta. He used to go around the country telling people that Roundup was safe as an independent scientist for the University of Florida. Mm. And then it leaked out in emails that he was being paid by Monsanto to fly around the country and say that Roundup was safe. He would even do things like have a podcast where he would interview a scientist and it would be himself with like an altered voice and be interviewing like an expert that was saying that the GMO roundup was safe and it was literally him like came out that he was abusing his wife and like all this crazy information about him and I'm like man that's an actual guy that he was a shill like he was working for them being paid knowingly and he, it came out he was exposed the truth came to light and that's what I just try to edu try to remind people like don't spin your wheels too much on them you know focus on people, small mind, focus on ideas and how to change the world, I think that we'll just leave them in the dust. Um, I have people that I get rubbed the wrong way with, I just click unfollow and go about my life. It brings me back, I had a guy who was found this method of um, battling with the IRS and um, just government laws in general where he would, you could get out of almost anything by this, the type of wording he would use. And he would ask a question and they would say, you know, you owe this much money in taxes. And he'd say, well, what, uh, what, what evidence do you have that the law applies to me? And they go, well, you're a, you're a citizen of the United States. And he go, does the law not apply to people who aren't citizens of the United States? And they'd be like, well, well, no. Um, and then he would just keep only asking questions. And then whenever they would make a claim, he would respond, well, what evidence do you have to support that claim? What evidence do you have to support the claim that the law applies to me just because I was physically born here in Florida? And then it would go down this road and they would either bail out and drop the case because they're like, this guy's a lawyer or this is way over our head. Or he would get them to a point where like they would have to like prove that the law applied to him and they couldn't. It was this really interesting thing. But not to go off on that tangent, it just brought me back to thinking about flat earth when I had this conversation with this guy. Cause I'm like, that's exactly what flat earth is. Do you have evidence to support your claim? Like, yeah, the earth's, well, how do you know the other side? I see all the other, uh, the lights in the sky, the planets, they're all, they look round to me. So the earth must be round. The earth is, well, I'm like, well, you're working off the assumption that the earth's a planet. They're like, well, yeah, what, what you don't think it is. I'm like, well, let's, we have to take a step back here and start there. If you're going to compare it to other planets, is it a planet? Do you have evidence to support the claim? And that's when you get to those proofs. Well, there's pictures. That's a photograph that could be doctored. That's not evidence. And then you just work your way down that line. And I think then people really start to realize, wow, there really isn't any evidence. And then you go to the other side and you see all the evidence that you can pile up. And it's just wild how you grow up thinking there's endless evidence for the globe and flat earth is stupid it's literally the exact opposite when you break it all out and lay it on the table it's just yeah. wild